next speaker is um, Tom Glover, <clears throat> who's going to be talking on dynamical landscape of reservoir computing with elementary CAs. So you want to show you oh. Okay, thank you very much. Over to Tom. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, right, welcome to this talk on the dynamical landscape of reservoir computing with elementary cellular automata. I'm Tom Glover. I am part of Oslo Metropolitan University in Oslo, Norway. I am working there on the Living Technology Lab with the Living Technology Lab, and I'm part of the Deep CA project there. So, why this? Why am I interested in this topic? Well, the short answer is that I better wanted to understand the important factors for practically setting up a reservoir computing system, or we were, I should say. Uh, the slightly longer answer is that uh, you know this little famous topic of deep learning has this very energy intensive um, training time, and it also has this implied centralized control where you have to like credit the error. Um, and we have this nice little framework called reservoir computing, which has uh, shown a reduced potential for, for, the training, uh, for the training time, as well as a uh, much less requirement for the centralized control. And if you combine that with cellular automata, you have like at least a potential for the further speed up, especially in uh, when it's implemented. Uh, and previous studies in this topic of reservoir computing with cellular automata had never really considered the entire rule space of elementary cell automata with memory. No, not with memory, just elementary cell automata. I see I have a typo there. Uh, and they were very experimental in nature. We wanted to be a little bit more systematic. And if you're a little bit curious about how this ties into our project at the Living Technology Lab, uh, you should watch Christine's presentation on Wednesday at 12.30 CST. So the first thing you need to understand is cellular automata. There'll be a couple of other talks about this today, so you'll get another or two chances to understand it, but here is my short twist on it. Uh, it's an idealized complex system, or at least it's been called that. Uh, it has these nice features of being fully parallel, uniformly connected and synchronized. And I'm specifically in the topic of a special case of cellular automata called the elementary cellular automata, which has specifically three neighbors, one dimension, two states. And that means it has exactly 256 distinct rules or ways to set it up. So the way it works is that you have a state, which is uh, you have a set of cells, which has a set of states being black or white. And uh, based on its immediate right and left neighbor and its current state, it looks up its next turns a state in this neighborhood scheme here. And this has exactly eight potential configurations, meaning that this can be reduced into uh, an eight bit string, which is why you perhaps already understand why it's 256. And the convention for this is that you turn this into a decimal number and this is the name of that specific rule, this one being rule 110. So that's a very short explanation, but we don't really have time to go into all the details. So here is a, classification of uh, elementary cell automata that is quite well known, called the Wolfram classification, which splits uh, all the rules into these four distinct behaviors, uniform, periodic, chaotic, and complex, where uniform turns into this uh, same state of black or white. Uh, periodic has a tendency to flip between a short set of states. Uh, the chaotic one is really hard to predict, uh, and the complex one is where you have these large structures which has trajectories that sort of transcend more states. But uh, here is a slightly less known uh, classification called elementary cellular automata with memory, which uh, is in a way a build on the Wolfram classification, where this uh, researcher tried to um, give elementary cell automata a bit of a memory by making them, instead of just considering the previous state, also consider uh, a set of previous states and collapsing those state using a memory function, uh, with, which was in this case, parity, majority, minority. Um, so you collapse, like, for example, if you consider the last three states, you collapse them all using the majority function. If they all were black, then it's still black. If you did the minority function, they would turn white because that is the minority. And you collapse them and use the same transition table in the same rule. So the question here essentially asked was, does this then change the Wolfram classification of that specific rule? And he found that the rules could be classified in these three different ways, strong, moderate, or weak, which uh, have been defined by me as uh, uh, strong being mostly memory functions change rules to another different class quite quickly. And the moderate one, uh, you 
can transform to a different class, but also can serve the same original class. And the weak one don't transform at all. Uh, so the reason why I say defined by me is because this definition is slightly different than the original definition, because I found that the strong and weak one is flipped from the evidence. And you could see the reason for that in the paper, uh, if you're curious. So uh, moving on just along here and trying to have like a really quick explanation of what reservoir computing is as well. And that is this nice little framework where you specifically only actually train the linear readout layer. So what does that mean in an example? Well, consider this uh, little neural network here where you have some inputs that you randomly map into your reservoir or your hidden layer or your substrate, whatever you want. And this is randomly done. And inside this reservoir, there are random connections. Um, but you can train the specific output layer by training this one, but it's very important that you do not train this central layer here. So I would uh, explain this as being somewhat substrate agnostic because people have done use this framework on many different substrate, not just the recurrent neural networks, as you see in this example. People have done it with a bucket of water where they take little drip droplets that drip on the surface of the water, creating waves, and they can take an image of the water and use A lot of higher dimensions and just extract the relevant features from that dimensions, those dimensions. So in another a little bit of an interstitial way of how that works, consider this example where you have this two-dimensional plane, where you have these two classes of square blue and circle reds, which do not linearly separate. You have to create like a squiggly line in order to do it. But if you spread it into many dimensions, one of them, for example, being z here, you can preserve the distance between internally, but somehow um, extend the distance between the classes and therefore you can actually linearly separate them. And there could be many other dimensions here that fail to do that, or there could be like a set of dimensions that allow you to do that. But this is just like an intuitional way of how that can work. So what does that mean when you add cellular automata to that? Well, it's, as I said, pretty much agnostic. So you could just drop out this thing and add cellular automata instead, uh, essentially. But there are some details about how I did that. So I specifically try this uh, very common benchmark called the 5-bit memory benchmark, uh, which is very common in this specific topic. And I want to encode that benchmark into my substrate, being my cellular automata. I did that specifically by inputting the task and XORing it with the current state of the cellular automata. Uh, my cellular automata is a limit to cellular automata, as I said, and it can permeate more times than the actual input, meaning that you can have several cellular automata steps before you input again. Um, the classification model that I specifically use, or my output layer, is a support vector machine with a linear kernel, linear being very important. And my output is that I want you know, the target output of the five bit memory benchmark. Uh, so how does that benchmark look? Well, it looks a bit like this in very, very simple terms. You put five bits into your substrate or your cellular automata in my case. You perturb it a lot of times, poke it, uh, add some noise to it, input some things. Then you want to, after a set number of times or a set number of steps and a set number of perturbations, you want to recover your original five bits. So in this example, you can see 10001 is temporally inserted. It uh, steps here. This is the reverse of it. Um, and you want to recover it again after a long period. So this can essentially because you're always classifying something as you input something. This can essentially be considered a classification task with a temporal element to it. So you do exactly 210 classifications in this case. Uh, you train and test on all permutations of the five bits when you do this. Um, and I, in my case, I didn't think the number five was particularly holy. And I tried with uh, four bits, six bits, and stuff like that. So I would translate that into the X bit memory benchmark in case you were wondering why I did that. Uh, yes. So this is a quick rundown of how it can look. So in this example here, I used uh, cellular automata rule zero, which is a very boring, some would say, a rule, because the next step 
is always going to the same quiescent state. Everything turns black or well, blue in this case. Uh, so that allows you to only see the actual inputs that is inputted into the system. So here you can see like the, an input channel of what is added to the, into it. So it's a 10001 and then a lot of perturbations. Then you have the Q signal and then you want to be able to predict again. So the important thing to note here is that you cannot really, you know, send the entire thing into the support vector machine because then you could just like look at the history. So I only take the last four steps to classify, put that into support vector machine that makes a prediction, which in this case is wrong because rule zero has a very poor memory capacity. Uh, so yeah, this is a very short, quick explanation of all the parameters in this experiment as well, uh, or some of them actually, there's arguably more than this. Uh, so some of the ones that are relevant here is uh, the redundancy level, which means if you might, might have already noticed that there are several places where you input, and this is uh, redundantly done usually, defined by the R number. Uh, I also vary the number of bits I put into the system. I also vary which rules I use in the system. And I also have like a short experiment where I change the LD, which in my specific case, I do this with R equal ones, meaning the LD will actually just be the grid size. Uh, yes. So I uh, have uh, two ways to measure the performance. The first one being very conventional way that has been done on previous studies where you just consider the perfect run, meaning that every single classification and every single permutation of your X bit has to be correctly classified, which is about 6,000 cases. And if a single one of those is wrong, you get a zero credit. And if everything's correct, you get a one. Uh, this was, you know, this didn't really allow us to compare to uh, all the rules uh, and it sort of doesn't give any partial credit. So we tried to invent a little bit of a different method to do that. So we just did the average classifications, but considering that there is a large set of the rules, sorry, a large set of the classifications that are exactly the same class, uh, about 97% roughly, uh, we decided to weight it um, from the max to the min in order to better view the difference. So we essentially zoom into the relevant bit of the score. So the specifics of the setup is that every configuration explored is tested 100 times, uh, every bar, every point of the line graph that you will see soon. I'm only presenting the minimum equivalence of elementary cellular automata, meaning the 88 rules that have uh, is representing their own group. Um, the full results can be found on GitHub. Uh, we actually also did find that some of the rules within uh, the same group did not actually get the same performance, uh, which was interesting to us. Uh, this is specifically built using Skikit Learn for the support vector machine, and I used something called Aerodynamics uh, for the cellular automata. So here are some graphs, my results, um, which might seem a little bit chaotic. Uh, I hope the physicists will forgive me for using that term, um, but there is some order here. So. Uh, this is the rule on the bottom here, which rule is specifically, and you see the score. This is organized in the following way. First on the Wolfram classification. So first on class one, but seeing as class one did not get any score, they just got flat zeros everywhere. Uh, they are essentially just filtered out. Uh, so this next one will become class two, the periodic ones, which go from seven to 36. Then you have the chaotic ones, which goes from 18 to 150. Then you have the complex ones, which is 54 to 110. This is further separated or so sorted using the elementary cell automata with memory classification, uh, where you have the strong, the moderate, the weak, then you have the strong again, uh, then the moderate chaotic ones, uh, sorry, the weak chaotic ones, there is no moderate. And then you have the strong complex ones because there is no moderate or weak complex ones. So what do we see here? There's a lot of things going on. Uh, for one, we can sort of separate this into being somewhat stable or something somewhat vulnerable to the different parameters. In this case, you can see some surprising results uh, to us at least, where you find that some rules have peaks on the exact level of redundancy. Uh, it's been previously explored that um, more redundancy is better because that essentially also increases your grid size, meaning you have more dimensions passed to the support vector machine, which is uh, assumed to be better, but there seems to be some level of dynamics of how to exactly set it up for some rules. We could also find this, this peak seems to be existent in rules that are very heavily explored already uh, being around four. Uh, yeah, 
So there seems to be also some rules that need like a sufficient R to get any so sufficient redundancy to get any results whatsoever, like these uh, strong chaotic ones. And we already see a little bit of a correlation here with the uh, elementary cell automata with memory. For example, the same example of these uh, strong chaotic ones having the very similar behavior, uh, very different compared to their weaker cousins. Uh, we could also see some example of uh, what I've defined as cheating. Uh, for example, rule 204 here gets uh, like a perfectly flat weighted average score. The reason for that is that uh, this system has essentially two states being the no output state and then the giving the was one to zero outputs. So it can actually know when the Q signal gets and perfectly detect that, but it cannot remember the input, meaning it can get a weighted average of about 50 because there are rules that can't even detect the Q signal, which is why you see this little flat thing here because it can never memorize the actual input, at least for uh, more than one bit. We also find some rules that uh, highlight the sort of weakness of the weighted average here. Uh, for example, this rule 62, which gets a very high score, about 90, but get no perfect runs whatsoever. Uh, yeah. So we tried some other things as well. We tried to make the task a lot harder and a lot easier uh, by changing the number of bits we wanted to put into the system. Uh, so just to signify uh, how much harder and how much easier the task becomes by changing this. Um, so we test on all permutations of uh, the bits, uh, meaning that for five, that is 32. For four, that would be 16. So it, it halves every time. So there's half a number of classification that need to separate from each other uh, for every increase, sorry, decrease. So uh, three bits should be a lot easier than four bits. But uh, this is not the case for all the rules, or they at least show a very, very small difference. Some actually even show uh, a preference. So like rule in five and one here, which seems to find uh, three easier than four, which is completely perfectly natural, but they somehow again find five easier than four. And uh, six, again, harder, the same for rule one. Now, there is a difference when you uh, add three bits with four bits. It's uh, the string that you input is a slightly longer, so the test becomes slightly longer with an increased bit. There could be a specific vulnerability here to the exact length of the experiment. Uh, could also be that the exact length of how you input and how the rule behaves means that you effectively delete the previous input or not, depending on uh, how many bits. So we already see a little bit of a separation here in behavior between the chaotic and complex and the periodic rules, the chaotic and complex being here. Uh, they have a lot more vulnerability to having the, uh, the task being coming from very easy to very hard. Uh, we also see some peaks here. And let's look at the perfect runs as well. We see the same stuff here, but we can't see the very dynamic ones, but we still see some peaks and preferences. Uh, we're still seeing some correlation here with uh, elementary cell automata with memory. And we also found these rules that surprised us a bit uh, because they found uh, three bits, uh, like got a okay score on that, but somehow managed to, even when we increase that to eight bits, not really get a very big difference in performance. Uh, the reason for that then would have to be uh, that there is only a stochastic element left uh, in how you specifically the positions of where you input your input streams. Five and minutes. this, sorry? Five minutes. Okay, thank you. I'll uh, rush then. <laughs> Uh, yes, so this is specifically vulnerable to where you exactly put your inputs then, uh, meaning that there is a, some sort of uh, different in how easy a task is based on how where exactly you put your inputs into the seller automata, uh, because that's the only stochastic difference between a success and a failure. Um, so we also was a little bit interested in these peaks and uh, previous studies have found, uh, at least for rule 90, the, the grid size is particularly relevant for the randomization period. Uh, so we tried to reduce, as I said earlier, uh, the grid size just to a single parameter. And we tried rules that could solve this problem with just a single level of redundancy and uh, just vary the grid size, which in this case is uh, equal to the LD. Uh, so we did that for rule 90, 60, 170, and 10. Um, and we can see this uh, quite extreme a difference in performance uh, based on very, very small differences in the grid size. So uh, rule 90 is the example there. Uh, gets uh, the, the absolute worst score, the same score as rule zero would have gotten, 
uh, with 39 and uh, gets a pretty good score with 40, uh, meaning that is extremely vulnerable to the exact setup. We also see that this um, actually reversely correlates to the randomization period, which was a bit surprising because we thought that a better, more randomization would be more, mean more separation, but uh, it probably means that it over separates in this case, is what I believe at least. Uh, we also see that this is not so true for the more boring rules, uh, like rule 170, which is just a left shift operator, essentially. Um, so this is less vulnerable to that, which is expected. Uh, but these rule 1960s are the ones that are usually very popularly tried in this sort of field of uh, if reservoir computer with cellular automata. Uh, so this means that there is some relevance. We also find this pattern of odd versus even, where um, odd numbers perform very poorly and even numbers perform very well for these two rules. So, some conclusions. Uh, we find that elementary cell automata with memory and Wolfram classification correlates a bit with behavior. Uh, we find these rules that have been previously studied have a very high sensitivity to the grid size. Uh, we find that the element additive cell automata performs quite well. Uh, this includes rule 170. Uh, we find a very surprising level of dynamics that uh, was higher than we expected. So what will we do in the future? Well, we haven't really explored all the parameters yet, so we'll do those. Uh, we also fully acknowledge that the 5-bit memory benchmark is just like a measure of memory. It's not really the full vector of computation. So we want to do other benchmarks, specifically things that would require transformation or manipulation of the input. And uh, we saw this example that there are uh, some rules that have very, very vulnerability to the exact mapping. Uh, that would mean that there are good and bad mappings, at least for those rules. So some way to evolve those different mappings could be useful. So uh, this has been the topic of my uh, talk. There's no time to explain, just follow me. Uh, so maybe there are some questions. Thank you. And I'll provide the virtual applause. Um, do we have any questions, please? Um, oh, that was an applause hand, not a not a question hand. Okay. Um, any questions? I, I I actually have a question. I mm -hmm. I might have missed it because I was uh, checking the time and so on. When you put the bits in, are they mm -hmm. consecutive bits going in, or are they spread out across uh, a large cellular automaton? Uh, well, I mean, that depends on the rule, if they spread up or not. You're thinking about the, this one, I suspect, right? Yeah, so they're, uh, they're going to be quite spread out across the width of the CA. Yeah, if, if you use like a different rule, like rule 90, which I did in this example, it would spread out, right? Uh, but because I used rule zero, they just immediately just get deleted, right? Yeah, no, sorry, what uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not expressing myself well. Um, you've got a quite wide cellular automaton and you're putting five bits into it. Are mm -hmm. those five bits next to one another in the line, or are they? Ah. Yes, I see. Uh, so they're actually temporally inserted. So they're inserted one at a oh. time, and then you have like one, and then you do two cellular automata steps and insert oh, it again. Okay. Sorry, I misunderstood. Yes. Yes, it's uh, it's uh, it would seem lo logical to do it like that, but we're specifically doing this temporally. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Are there any other questions? One of the things we can do if, if you think of questions later, obviously, is to move them to the um, Slack channel. Um, and I think the, the speakers will, will be looking at those. Um, so um, one of the things here is if, if you want it, so you've got a kind of a one bit input uh, into this. Um, um, have you looked in, are you looking in the future at putting in multiple inputs at the same time? Uh, right. Uh, so not yet. Uh, we want, we want to do like different things, just the ex exact benchmark of force. And some, some of them will be like that. Right. Um, cause that is like a future work. Uh, but we are technically inserting more because we're doing it redundantly, but you know, yeah. <laughs> thanks. Um, so, uh, Georg. Yeah, hi. Uh, I have a question. What are the scenarios where you think that this kind of reservoir is really, really helpful, right? So this, um, mm -hmm. when do you want to use the particular computation capabilities of a CA somehow? What, is, what, are, what are your thoughts? Uh -huh. uh, well, uh, that's a, a long answer, I, say, I would guess. But uh, so um, 
the reason why we're interested in reservoir computing itself, right, is because this, uh, this as I explained earlier, that these uh, typical types have very long training times, and this has a potential for reducing it. And there's also a little bit more of a biological possibility to it. Uh, so specifically, stellar automatons, the reservoir, can be uh, implemented into FPGA, right? Uh, field programmable, ah, I can't say it, field programmable gate array, uh, which uh, means that you can directly implement it into hardware, quite simply, uh, at least for elementary stellar automata. Uh, so it has this potential to hardware, and you can, we, we've seen examples that these can solve little, you know, toy examples, right? And we've seen that in reservoir computing, this solves a little bit more things like uh, medical classifications and stuff like that. So uh, the one thing we, we want to like expand upon and sort of create this uh, better understanding of how to set it up so that we can actually get and solve these sort of harder tasks. So one thing that we will do in the future is we're going to integrate this with the biological neural networks and try to communicate between them. Um, and so what sort of tasks you usually solve with reservoir computers usually rely on this temporal nature, right? Because uh, specifically uh, recurrent neural networks, which has to have some sort of memory in the system are extra hard to train, right? Because you don't know how far back into the history you have to find the error accredited. So you can just skip that entire step with uh, reservoir computing. Does that help you understand a little bit? Because this is, this is essentially base science. We're not really... Uh, Really have an no, this I understand. Tomorrow. I was just thinking about. I mean, typically you set up your reservoir for. I mean, mm -hmm. because it has particular properties that you that you want, right? And the CA has mm -hmm. its intrinsic uh, way of computing. And so I thought maybe you have some very specific ideas where exactly that would be used, except the fact that you can implement this now in an FPGA or something. I this is more like the the way how you do it, and not the way why you do it, really. So, so I was just wondering. Um, Maybe you had uh, some uh, some cool applications where you would say that exactly the kind of inductive bias that is is coming from a CA instead of a, another type of reservoir is really getting you the boost that you that you expect, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So far, there hasn't been any sort of evidence for that. Uh, that is, uh, except for these sort of benchmark tests that I know of. I mean, some people have done medical classification and stuff like that. And some people rely more on the theoretical framework of cellular automata in order to sort of be able to identify useful reservoirs. But so far, it's mostly in the toy world. <laughs> thanks, thanks. Okay, I think uh, Barbara has a hand up, I think. Mm -hmm. So Barbara, do you want to ask a question? Yes, thank you. Uh, so hello, Tim. Thank you for the oh. presentation. Um, I still find it fascinating that it seems from most reservoir experiments that the cellular automata whose local rules are linear functions seem to be doing the best at this task. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, the way you uh, input the consequent inputs is by soaring it to the, to the state of the CA? Is it the case? Uh, sorry, I, I, I missed a word. What did you say? XOR to combine. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. I'm wondering uh, if you use some nonlinear way of um, embedding the input to the state of the CA, whether it would change the fact that linear CAs would stop being the most successful ones. So it's mm. just a suggestion for a future experiment because it seems that the whole ensemble is linear until the last support vector machine readout. So I was wondering if, yeah, I would be just curious mm. to know how this would work with a different embedding of inputs. Yeah, right, right. Uh, so other, other people have done other experiments with inputs uh, different ways. I, I used XOR because it seemed to give the best performance. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's not really a linear way to input it, I suppose, because it's, you know, XOR doesn't linearly separate. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's this is uh, um, a difficult question for me. <laughs> it's a very mathematical question. Um, so there's uh, <laughs> no worries. <laughs> uh, so linear. Let me try to summarize the question. So li linear inputs uh, is is best. Could... Well, what I mean by linear is that mm -hmm. if you see this as a mapping from the initial configuration until the output, it is mm -hmm. basically a linear mapping between vector spaces. So it acts good with respect to the XOR operation in some sense. That's what I mm -hmm. mean by linear. Um... Yeah, I, I think the XOR is really helpful. 
because I uh, this I could solve the same task that I previous experiments with a lot smaller reservoir sizes, mm -hmm. um, meaning of smaller dimensions. So I think that uh, that is uh, a lot easier, at least in my case. But maybe it's different when you do some other task that is memory based. Uh, you say there are other experiments, so maybe I should read the literature first and then see how uh, how the linear rules uh, are good overall. So thank you for hmm? the suggestion. I can send you some suggestions if you're interested. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that'd be great. Thank great. you. Great. Thank, thank, thank you, everybody. Um, and let's, um, I'll, on everybody's behalf, thank Tom again. And, um, and now we move on to our next speaker, who is...